You can see the changing of the Churchin God by the time they are the beating heart of the Churchin army at the Guk Sudong Palace. And so, what we're about to explore is how to represent these noble and valiant warriors in one twenty second step. I was in Chanjushi during the Korean national holiday of Chuseok. At this time, people travel home to see family. I had no family with me. All I had were these quiet streets which did not quite conceal the muffled laughter and bustle of gathered households which had closed off into their own little worlds. But with all of Chanjushi before me, I could hear sounds of life from the Hanok village. Crowds were gathering. Up close, there was this concentration of the masses of their accumulated shouting and shuffling and stamping of feet that demands attention, that signifies an event of great moment. And here I was, in the center. As a great dragon emblazoned banner swung overhead, fluttering and rippling in the wind, the drums of Chanjushi began to beat and the chanting, the banners, traditional dress, and even the antiquated buildings around us took me back in time to a different era. As I was transfixed by the performance, I had a sudden thought and I rushed to write it down on my phone before I forgot. The thought was that music makes the martial spirit. There is something primal about music and rhythm and the way we respond to sound. Human beings seem to exhibit an innate musicality. The echo of drums over the chatter of voices invoked some determined tempo, like the heartbeat of the crowd resounding into the open. And in this ancient traditional form, I could only imagine that this was something similar to the trepidation the Chosun Koreans might have heard and felt all those hundreds of years ago. I had come here to this country to research the Chosun military by both the technical information gleaned from museums and libraries, but also to imbibe the spirit and essence of the culture and the people. For the latter, I wanted to be able to feel what it meant to be Chosun and Korean. It was in the drums and banners of Chanjushi where I felt that spirit most openly and powerfully. The mid Chosun dynasty military was the main form of defense for the people of Korea against steppe nomads and pirates, and later the cataclysmic invasions of the Japanese. By the 16th century, the military had become weak by the disavowment from Confucian scholars, and two centuries of relative peace. The Imjin War was devastating for the country, but the army regrouped, adapting new weapons and organizational structures, and underwent a major transformation from this catalyst. This video is a guide to depicting the mid Chosun military. The Chosun dynasty lasted from 1392 to 1897, and in that time, the military underwent organizational and visual changes over hundreds of years. As such, the scope of this video specifically focuses on mid Chosun around the period of the Imjin War. The first section will briefly cover the historical organization, appearance, and armaments of the army. The second section will cover the themes of this army. The third section will cover tips on modeling, converting, and painting. And the fourth and last section will cover a summary of the army. Historical organization, appearance, and armaments. The military history of the mid-Chosun army will be simplified 
and summarized for the convenience of the average wargamer looking for the background to contextualize their army. In my research, I had the help of an amateur Korean historian who I will give the pseudonym KSW. He explained many concepts, answered many questions, and helped share information I would not have found otherwise. So many thanks to him. The mid Chosun army organization was divided into two formal categories, central and provincial. This was called the Owi and the Chongbyong. Owi translates to meaning five guards. The Owi was the national army made of salaried volunteer soldiers tasked with guarding the whole nation, focusing on the capital. The Owi consisted of five regiments, with the right guard, the rear guard, the center guard, the front guard, and the left guard. Each regiment held different specialized units, such as the Kapsa, residing in the center guard. Chungbyong translates to meaning regular soldiers. The Chungbyong was made of regional armies, consisting of unpaid, conscripted soldiers who guarded their respective provinces. Members of the Chungbyong were divided into three man teams of Pongchuk taxation units. One man would serve, being indirectly financially supported by the other two via poll tax. This man in service would be rotated out for the next person in the Pong Chuk unit after his term of service was done. The military organization of both central and provincial armies was the same at the lower level. An O had five soldiers, a Te had 25 soldiers, a Yo had 125 soldiers. Central army higher organization was as follows. A Tong had 500 to 1,000 soldiers. A U had 3,000 soldiers. A We had 15,000 soldiers. Provincial Army Higher Organization was as follows. A Sojin had one or more than two. Ya. A Ko Jin had many Sojin in it. A Ju Jin had many Ko Jin in it. Commanders in provincial army higher organizations had dual titles reflecting both administrative and military responsibilities. One case to note is that Wei Jung from the O Wei could become Yongma Zhou Du Sa to supplement the absence of Quan Zhou Sa in times of war. The highest level of army organization and command was as follows. Tu Chongguan and the Doan Su. During the Imjin War, the Chongbyong and O Wei started its transition to the corresponding structures of the Sok O Gun and O Gun Yong. All four structures coexisted during the war. But this video will only cover the Chongbyong and O Wei as they formed the core of the mid Chosun military. During the Imjin War, many remnants of provincial troops, civilian volunteers, and monk soldiers formed into informal righteous armies called Weibyong. Yangban Confucian scholars called Chunbi that led rural cooperatives in peacetime, applied their leadership qualities into wartime, and raised the first civilian resistance forces, having the personal wealth to outfit these guerrilla armies. The composition and origins of righteous armies could vary greatly according to the circumstances of war. On the battlefield, the infantry Tong was the basic unit of the battle formation system of the early to mid Chosun army. In this, Tung would be many Ya, each specializing in a different weapon type. The standard battle formation was sword and shield bearers in the front, hand gunners following them, spearmen behind them, glaive wielders behind the spearmen or the archers, depending on battlefield conditions, and archers usually in the rear. Kapsa would usually be deployed to protect the formation on the left and right flanks on foot or on horses. 
The composition of the mid Chosun army before the Imjin War was roughly equal ratios of melee infantry, ranged infantry, and cavalry. Themes When painting an army, I first consider the themes that govern and underpin the essence of the whole army. In the case of the Chosun righteous Koreans, the themes are beards and topknots, many bare faces for righteous armies. There is an opportunity to showcase Korean hairstyles. Diverse colors. Diverse colors with white secondary color and gray tertiary color. Mostly pale yellow, red and blue for brigandine, grays for monks, mostly white for gorillas. They are unified by brown dirt and grime to show the desperation of the situation, but also shared adversity regardless of class and wealth. Spot color, red, for vengeance. Rough, ad hoc, ununiform and ragtag, but unified by passionate national spirit. Informal organization and ranks. Unity is shown by close ranked poses facing outwards. No banners, to focus on the reality of camaraderie rather than symbolic abstraction in a time of crisis and to contrast with the other Imjin armies. Land of the Bow, prevalence of archers. Hilly mountainous bases. This video will now explain each theme in detail. I want my models to reflect the hairstyles that would be typical of the period. Both top knots and beards were commonplace and with the righteous army being a makeshift army with civilian volunteers, there are many opportunities for unhelmeted heads. Having more bare heads would also contrast with Chinese and Japanese armies tending to be more armored. There was no uniform in the Korean army at this period. The military standard was to wear hyupsu, then armor over that, and the hyupsu could be a range of darker colors. Helmets and lamellar armor would tend to be black. Chainmail, plate with mail and paper armor would tend to be dark. Pants and shirts could be a range of colors. With color diversity, how can you achieve visual unity to tie the whole force together on the tabletop? I still wanted to make the force mostly historically accurate. My solution was to use white as a secondary color because the Koreans wore white as daily clothing, unlike the Chinese or Japanese, which reserved it as a color for mourning and funerals. White is therefore iconic for Korea and my Korean miniatures, and so it was an important color to implement as a visual identifier. A tertiary color for many of the troops would be gray, as many armors, except for brigandine, would be an iron or gray color. Therefore, the chest and head would often be this gray tertiary color, with black helmets being visually close as well. However, brigandine colors break this palette a little, but if the overall unit conforms to these color themes, I think enough of a visual identity can be established. Brigandines would historically be mostly pale yellow or nankeen, as this was the default color of the cotton, but we also have relics of blue and red brigandines from the period, according to Chinese concepts of Wu Xing, followed by the Koreans. One theory is brigandine colors would correspond to the colors of each direction for the guard camps of the or we, so I believe that a range of brigandine colors was possible. Monks usually had grey robes. Some may have worn the orange half robe. Lower class guerrilla volunteers, such as peasants, humbles and slaves, wore more white, but not exclusively, as all white was more characteristic of late Chosun. The unifying colours for these diverse troop types would therefore be white and grey. However, I also wanted to unify the warriors with the use of dirt splatters on their legs and lower clothing. This use of brown would further unify the diverse colors, but also imply the worn nature of the Chosun fighting men, who are struggling from the unjust invasion of the Japanese, and show how everyone is going through the same struggle despite former class differences. 
This army is an army of spirit and passion, a righteous army. The concept of a spot color is to choose a contrasting color that stands out in a color scheme to attract attention and draw focus when used sparingly. I chose red as my spot color, which symbolizes passion in Korean culture and is far brighter than the drab armors and contrasts with the neutral whites. Red can symbolize anger and the desire to spill blood. Red in this case shows the Chosun desire to avenge their fallen. The disorganized and ununiform appearance of my units and broader army symbolizes the makeshift provisional organization of the righteous army. These warriors could have a variety of origins and therefore appearances. It's worth noting that even formal government armies would not have uniforms either, but I wanted to further accentuate the variety for my depiction. The miniatures also have a range of mixed weapons without structure in my units to show their makeshift nature. But I do have a battle line unit in formation with shields and pole arms to show that former formations are still used and how the army is a mix of civilians and disorganized and organized remnant forces. I did try to make individuals be closer on the base and facing outwards to show how they are ideologically unified and outnumbered in a desperate situation and unified despite their disparate appearance. This army will have no banners to fit in the theme of shared brotherhood regardless of prior class. I thought about the best way to convey the spirit of the Koreans and a righteous army. While formal government forces used banners and standards, and righteous armies could have used them too, I think banners are a level of abstraction to represent values. And the symbolism is fine, but it's one level removed from real human beings. I think having no banners at all concentrates the audience's attention on the men rather than the standards, which therefore humanizes the whole appearance of the army and has the benefit of being historically plausible. It also contrasts with the other East Asian armies, with the Japanese having the most banners. I did conceptualize an infantry leader regiment bearing a single banner, Iwo Jima style, to symbolize the whole army rallying around the country but I think it doesn't work as well for my theme of camaraderie regardless of class, so I decided on having no banners at all. Korea has been famous for its archery since ancient times. Chosun people practiced archery in their leisure time. It was a component in both civil and martial examinations, and the Korean focus on its art led to developments such as male and female thumb rings and the baby arrow. I wanted more of my models to carry bows in higher ratios than equivalent Chinese or Japanese forces. I think bases can further an army's themes. In this case, I considered that Korea famously has very mountainous terrain. There was a saying that if Korea was flattened, it would be as large as China. So I wanted my units to be on hill bases. However, I considered that I had a theme of shared adversity and a common goal overcoming social divisions. I had the idea to mount my cavalry on flat bases for two reasons. The most important was that it would put them at roughly eye level for my infantry, meaning that the total height of all my units would be roughly the same. This would imply their equal status in this army by the symbolic value of visual equality. The second factor was that cavalry operate best on flat ground, so it makes practical sense too. So my infantry are on mountain bases while my cavalry are on flat bases. I think a few of these themes would not work when depicting a central or provincial army of mid Chosun. If I was making a government force, I think there would be less color diversity, but still a lack of a uniform. I'd have banners, less unhelmeted heads, but I think I would keep the dirt and close poses to show the desperation of defending their homeland. So the look would be slightly more cohesive and neat, but not by a massive degree. I would further alter these themes if I was trying to depict a K-drama version of the mid Chosun army with the iconic Pojol uniforms. The theme of diverse colors would be kept, but the color palette 
for the army would be further narrowed to more black and white, with the exceptions being peasants in white and elite figures having brigandine and being more multicolored. So there would be more color variety the higher ranking a warrior is rather than the current theme of general color diversity throughout the army. Modeling, converting, and painting. So, with my themes conceptualized, how do we create models that match the themes while adhering to historical accuracy? Historical accuracy is something I try to achieve for historical armies, but I'm willing to compromise a little if the visual opportunities are compelling enough. I think everyone should have the personal choice to adhere to historical research as much as they would like because ultimately everyone's hobby is their own. When modeling and converting mid Chosan figures, I think your dilemmas will change depending on what manufacturer you've procured your miniatures from. Currently, there is a broad misconception of what historically accurate Chosun models look like in the miniature offerings from many companies. They tend to sell late Chosun policemen called Pojol as army infantry. These models can be used, but with some conversion work. For myself, I was using Red Box Korean infantry, which depict Pojol. Historically, army infantry would wear paper armor, chain mail, plate with mail, brigandine, or lamella, all mixed within units. Now, considering that you might have to convert a few of your models, I try to make the process as easy as possible. Paper armor is relatively easy to sculpt using green stuff. I just put two slabs over the shoulders and a rough jacket shape on the front and back with a little buckle at the front. I try to make more paper armors for my troops in general. Chainmail is just about taking the time to poke the holes in, but it is time intensive. I think you can sculpt plate with mail in a similar way by smoothing out the front and back or adding plasticard plates to the front and back. I think sculpting brigadine is very difficult, so I do not even bother. Lamella are rows of rectangles. I don't sculpt the strings holding the plates together because it's far too difficult for myself and too small to do accurately at 172nd scale. So therefore, most of my troops are converted to wear paper armor with a bit of chainmail and lamella. Historically, paper armor would typically be worn by the lowest ranks of troops, such as archers and hand gunners. But without armor regulations, there was a range of possible armors for all troop types. The poorest conscripted provincial troops might even be unarmored. It is worth noting that the iconic fish scale armor had not been invented yet for the Imjin War period. I also consider the helmets. Pojol are depicted as wearing Chan Lip, and the easiest way to make them into mid Chosun equivalents is to turn them into kettle helmets called Cham Ju. A prototype of the Chan Lip did exist during the Imjin War with a more irregular shape, so it is permissible in your army to have a few examples if you are depicting the Imjin War period, but they would not be very widespread. I use green stuff to sculpt iron banding upon the hats to simulate and recreate the kettle helm, but I think it's also possible to just paint it on. It's worth noting that this was the most popular type of helmet during this period, and it coexisted with the Mongol-influenced Kanju, the long cone-shaped war helmet. The typical soldier would wear a hupsu under their armor, which was a long, narrow-sleeved undercoat that went past the knees. Sculpts of Pojol typically do not depict their late Chosun Chanbuk as reaching past the knees, so I had to sculpt mine to be longer with green stuff. For variety, I also depict soldiers wearing quilted jackets called Nap Bli as makeshift gambesons, 
but that wasn't as commonly used as armor. Many manufacturers sell brigandine armored models and they are usually good. I just use red box sculpts out of the box. If making righteous armies, it's possible that you would want commoners and monks. Chosun civilians seem to often lack clothing variety, all with the same shirt, pants and leggings. I think you could green stuff different clothing items such as vests, jackets or hats if you wanted more figure variety. For the red box sculpts, I noticed that the shirts did not have the signature bow tie near the collar, so I sculpted a version on with green stuff. Monks I think are generally fine. They could be given an additional orange half cloak, but this is optional. You could sculpt it with green stuff. The weapons carried by most manufacturers figures tend to be accurate with spears, glaives, swords and shields. While tridents were used by Chosun soldiers, they were formalized in late Chosun as a support weapon, specifically used in the Korean equivalent of the Chinese Mandarin duck formation. For a mid Chosun army, it would have been far rarer. Many companies offer models with tridents. So, in making an Imjin War Korean army, it would be more historically accurate to convert them to spears or glaives. Flails were adopted for infantry after observing the Chinese during the Imjin War, but they were not formalized in army organizations until after the Japanese invasions. Many companies also do not offer representations of the more esoteric but emblematic Chosun weapons, such as the Se Chongtong and the Hyun Chan baby arrow, which could be a little difficult to sculpt with green stuff, but there are 3D prints available. When modeling cavalry, mid Chosun horsemen wielded lances, glaives, bows, and Se Chongtong. Flails were formalized for cavalry after the Imjin War. When painting the whole army, I like to choose army wide colors to unify disparate units. It visually ties everyone together and makes them look like a cohesive whole. As I discussed in my themes section, I chose to use white as a secondary color and gray as a tertiary color. White would tend to be on the legs and perhaps on some of the belts. Gray would be on the chests and heads in the form of armor, helmets, and even black hair that has been highlighted gray. It's all in a similar color range. I use red as a spot color to make models pop and have vectors to draw the eye, and so I was also inclined to make use of blue when I could, just because red, blue, and white make up the colors of the modern Korean flags, but that was only a minor consideration. When painting Chosun troops, I would classify them in three broad categories. Commoners, made up of peasants, humbles, and slaves, army troops, and monks. Within these categories, there are a range of appearances possible, particularly for the army troops. Mid Chosun commoners would wear a variety of colors historically. I wanted color diversity on these figures because only late Chosun commoners would have a higher tendency to wear white. Mid Chosun commoners could wear all white too, of course, but the all white color palette was established in mass by late Chosun, not mid Chosun. However, I wanted there to be more use of white on these figures and to evidence an overall white color tone. This is because white is my army's secondary color and there are more opportunities to showcase it here. As peasants, humbles and slaves were not necessarily armored and did not usually wear the military garb of the long leg concealing hupsu, allowing for more opportunity to showcase white. I made use of white shirts, pants, leggings and headbands. But when introducing color variety, I tried to keep the colors pale and desaturated. This makes them look more earthly to draw less attention and therefore not clash too much with each other and the white colors. The unifying use of white, the brown dirt, and their grayish to black hair on their heads all create a common look for the commoners that also links to the army troops. My army infantry mainly wear hupsu under their armor, which could be a variety of dark colors. 
This means that the individuals could look quite varied, which has the issue of making figures clash visually when placed together. This is where having a unifying tertiary colour works best on government troops, as they are mostly armoured and mostly look grey to iron to black on their chest, back and heads. I made sure their pants are white as well, so there is the unifying secondary colour and the use of brown dirt also visually ties everyone together. I like to use desaturated colours for outer layers like the hupsu because being closer to the grayscale makes them look more similar to white by being more muted and less vibrant. But I do make use of more saturated colours for variety and that is where the importance of the use of white, grey and brown come in. When painting brigandine, the use of pale yellow or nankeen would have been common, as it was the natural colour of undyed cotton. Historians don't know what colour indicated for Chosun brigandine, but it was unique for having small shoulder guard plates, so I try to paint a small line of bronze on the tip of both shoulders. In converting my models to wear hupsu, I deliberately left the opening at the front to be wider than realistic, but that was a visual choice to showcase more white and allow more of the secondary colour to be seen. Realistically, the hupsu would be more closed, but I took some artistic license. The more elite my army troops become, the less use of white there is. I wanted my elites to stand out with more detail and strong colour choices, but I did try to include some white when possible. My frontline infantry unit containing my shield bearers has almost no white, which breaks from the theme, but I was attempting to replicate an earthlier look from a Jinju Museum short film, and I think the red spot colours, dark helmets and body armor and finally the use of brown dirt are visually unifying enough. I would apply the principles of less white if depicting royal guardsmen. My monk wears grey robes and has an orange half robe. Monks would tend to wear grey robes but the orange half robe was optional. Monks break the general colour scheme of the army as they do not evidence white or dark grey or red, but there are ways around this. Monks could wear armour atop their robes. Their robes could be darker than usual to match the dark grey of the broader army. They could have white and red accessories and they could have the same brown dirt splatters. Monks are an opportunity to include standout figures to deviate from the look of the army, but I try to limit their numbers so the army retains an overall coherent visual identity. Summary So I would like to showcase my own models. My own army has undergone a transformation from the stereotypical but historically inaccurate K-drama look and has adopted recent historical research to present a more realistic version of the mid-Chosun army. When I was first making my army, I had the misconception that the stereotypical look of the Chosun army in Korean television was accurate. My preliminary research seemed to say that the television portrayal was inaccurate, but I could not find good sources to nail down an accurate look. Through further research and conversations with a Korean history enthusiast, I reworked my army to have more colour variety. While most of my units are now relatively historically realistic, I should note that my heavy cavalry unit has issues. I kept my heavy cavalry unit almost the same, converting the Morningstar to a more historically accurate flail and green stuffing the lamellar armour to be accurate. But flails and fish scale armour are more indicative of late Chosun. My choice to include these elements is that they're so characterful and iconic of the Chosun dynasty to me that I'm willing to bend history a little for the sake of visual impact. In the same way that Yi Sun Shin is often depicted in media as wearing fish scale armor, I wanted to capture that look for one of my own leader figures. My lore justification is that this unit has adopted prototypes of later elements of late Chosun, as there was a transition period where concepts were introduced then formalized. So they are pioneers for what is to come. The Chosun military is rarely explored in tabletop form and what drew me to it was its underrepresentation. I love seeing rare armies and learning about cultural practices and how they shape a military.
The Chosun army fought valiantly to defend their homeland, and the army of the mid-Chosun dynasty was a defensive garrison force, famed for their archery, adapted to fighting the cavalry of their longtime foe, the Jurchens, and unprepared from too much peace. With a civilized intellectual culture, a martial spirit was unneeded for hundreds of years until the Japanese came. And when they did, and sense turned upside down, the Chosun army found its courage. Amidst horror and slaughter, still there was valor, as there had always been all those hundreds of years ago. Uh, we've covered how to paint, model, and represent uh, the Chosun army in 172nd scale. I hope that was informative and educational for you. And I hope that you guys uh, go forth and uh, start some armies. It's, I think it's a very underrepresented period. So uh, you guys have a good one uh, and uh, paint some models.